Dr. Boone, Riverside Secondary. How is everybody feeling? Yeah. That's a nice morning start. So much better than the after lunch crowd. Um, my name is Johnny McRae. I am uh, delighted to be here as a guest host for the Poetry Slam that you are about to witness. Uh, we just had a bunch of amazing poetry in the first half of this event. We had 11 poets go, and they all killed it. And uh, I'm very excited for what you're about to see. Um, as we are going about this event, I just want to recognize uh, that uh, here we are on the traditional and unceded territories of the Kukwitlam First Nation, uh, lying within the shared territories of the Slavatooth, Katesi, Musqueam, Quaykwik, Squamish, and Stolo Nations. Uh, and please, you know, some snaps to the host nations here. Uh, I think it's important to recognize, specifically in relation to that, that we're here doing oral poetics, we're here doing spoken word, uh, poetry slam, if you will. And uh, so, in our own small way, uh, we are connecting uh, with a, a practice that exists in a very rich form amongst the, uh, the nations whose homes we are on uh, and, and the communities here. So, uh, so much of what we heard uh, in the first half really like, came back to what I was saying about the fact uh, that something I said last block about the fact that when we hear poems and we listen to other people's stories, it opens us up. Uh, it allows us to uh, gain a better understanding of the experiences and have, of other people and have more empathy and compassion in the way we go about the world. So hopefully, uh, even though it's one tiny little drop, it's one piece of working towards a better future where we can uh, you know, heal the harms that have been caused by settlement and colonialism here in this country um, and uh, you know, create spaces for uh, uh, all voices to be heard. So, uh, also, I just want to recognize the photos that you were seeing as you came in here were photos from Mr. Schoenhaus' photography class. So let's give it up for Mr. Schoenhaus' photography class. <laughs> and uh, if you've seen this event in the past, there is a new element, a uh, very exciting element. We have the People's Choice Award. So there are going to be 16 poets performing, or 16 poems you're going to hear uh, in this round. and. Uh, at the end of, after the 16th poet, a QR code is going to be shown on this incredible screen, which will be lowered down, and you will scan the QR code with your pocket computers, and then that will take you to a, uh, a Microsoft page. I don't even you know, it's all out of my Microsoft form. There you go, that's the correct thing. And on that form, you'll enter the name of the poet uh, that you think uh, should be the poet that gets recognized with the People's Choice Award, and that poet will win a prize. Uh, we also have four judges who are going to be judging the poetry with score. So the, the uh, People's Choice Award is really your, your way to make your vote known uh, uh, while the judges determine who is the winner of the Poetry Slam. Uh, a Poetry Slam, if you are unfamiliar, is a poetry competition. Uh, in the slam community, we like to say that the best poet never wins, and, and the point is not the point, the point is the poetry, uh, because really, that's the reality of it. Poetry Slam is not intended to be a great way of uh, vetting and selecting the finest poetry in the world. It's a way to make a poetry show uh, more engaging and intense and fun, and it's interactive. So there's all these poets who are going to be on stage today, and when they get up and they're doing their poems, we're going to be silent. Except for one thing that you can do, if you hear a line in a poem that you really like, or something you think is funny and you agree with, you can snap your fingers, just give that a try, snap your fingers a little bit there. And uh, that's a way that you can let the poet know, they're like, oh, I like that poem, it's resonating with me, it makes them feel good, and then that goodness comes back into their poem and out to you. Uh, so that's something you can do. Uh, and as I announce a poet, come up on stage. This is not a poetry event where we sit in dignified silence. This is a poetry event. It's kind of more like a rock show. So what I want you to do when I call a poet up to the stage is cheer as loudly as you can all the way until that poet has gotten to the microphone. Then we fall silent. We listen to the poem, maybe snap. And then when they're done, we're going to cheer equally loudly as they make their way back to their seat. Whatever you think of the poem, uh, we're going to cheer that loudly because we know that it takes courage to get up on a microphone in front of a whole room full of people and say anything at all, let alone uh, something that you have put time and effort and poured your heart into. Uh, so with that said, uh, our four judges, like I said, they're going to give each of those poems afterwards a score from 1 to 10. I'm going to come up, read out the scores, and then I'm going to say something to you, which is give it up for the poet and not the points, and then we're going to cheer for that poem again. It's going to be awesome, a lot of cheering, a lot of energy, uh, so get ready for that. And uh, lastly, 
before we jump into our first poet, uh, we need a calibration poet, what we in the Slam community like to call a sacrificial poet, uh, who's going to come up, perform a poem. They're not in the Slam, they're going to get a score uh, from the judges, so the judges can practice, and then uh, we're going to move straight into the Slam, and we're going to get going, and we're going to get going quick. So, uh, I'm going to ask you one question, and I'm going to say, are you ready for a poetry Slam? And when I do, uh, you're all going to yell, blood, back at me, okay? It's weird, have fun with it. Are you ready for a poetry slam? Oh, yeah, I forgot, we need a sacrificial poet. Uh, so, uh, please welcome to the stage our sacrificial poet for this second round of poetry slam, Johnny McRae! <laughs> I'm making from memories of nights when her grandfather would sit on my bedside and we would read aloud to one another from Kevin O'Connor and the Light Brigade, a beautiful red hardcover with skeletons charging on horseback under a navy blue sky on the sleeve. And there's already some books on this shelf, Redfish, Bluefish, and Hop on Pop, as well as a book of paintings and few words about the life cycles of salmon. The second shelf, I'm going to make from the pocket-sized poetry books her grandmother used to keep on a bedside table, and so here she'll learn about sonnets and haiku, every living thing, and whatever stories of myth time call her attention. She might sit on my knees the way I sat on her great-grandfather's and hear the music of speaking when the words call forth a voice. The third shelf, I'm going to make from the masking tape that holds together my first copy of Lord of the Rings. And so here she'll find her way with a golden compass, riding sandworms with Beowulf or Odysseus. Or she might travel to the moon in the shell of a giant snail where she'll learn the language of trees. Or she could slip on a ring, step into a pond, find herself in another world all together where everything that moves has words. The fourth shelf, I'm going to make from the bindings of old journals. So here she'll learn about free enterprise and ceremony. Teen angst, poetry, and raven song rising into thin air. Everywhere being is dancing on this shelf. The book thief goes train spotting and finds the kiss of the fur queen where some birds walk through the hell of it and my soft response to the wars is orange is not the only fruit of American gods. And by the time she's tall enough to reach the books on this shelf, she'll be old enough to pick whichever one she wants to be there. Old enough that when she asks me why the last book on the last shelf is oh, the places you'll go, I'll say, cause that shit's timeless, sunshine. And inside its cover, she'll find a note that says a book shelf should be a garden bed for stories. She should learn to read all the greasy fingerprints, the watermarks, and dog-eared pages. Learn to read the rips and tears and notes in the margins, the broken bindings, the missing bindings, the bindings that open to hand hearts like the uh, that open to hands like the hearts of old friends. And that this book or that books are made for generations of fingers, and I built this bookshelf out of a memory and a dream that someday I might hand down a little red hardcover under a navy blue sky with the words, take this book into your hands and know you are holding your grandfathers. Thank you. Now, as the judges are making their scores, I just gotta fix something because there is a giant hole in my pocket and my wallet has started sliding down. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay, judges, for the first time for that second question, oh, three, two, one, up with your scores! That's like we got the scores here. Sorry, Anita, uh, you are about to be called to the stage. But on deck, we have Kia Aragon. Right now, we're going to hear our first poem of this here poetry slam from Anita! I love my hair. It has a mind of its own. Each strand and curl adds to my personality. My hair makes me me. I love the feeling of my hair swaying as I dance to the song. It dances along, no matter how short or long. I love to braid, twist, clip, and tie my hair. It always feels best to let it free without a care. It can be stubborn, a little bit like me. My hair makes me free. I couldn't imagine being forced to cover up my hair, tucking away each coil, each fragment of my identity. Except, I don't have to imagine it. It's already a reality. For 44 years, women in Iran have been forced to hide their hair, hide their body, hide from the government's glare. For 44 years, our voices have been taken, our singing and opinions all ignored and forbidden. 
uh, but 44 years is far too long. That's the time to fight together, the time to be strong. The Women Life Freedom Movement began with misfortune. Ten months ago, a woman named Mahsa Amini was brutally beaten to death. For the cause none other than how she wore her hair, this isn't fair. Mahsa was murdered by the morality police. They have the audacity to call the crimes morality, removing all equality while taking our liberty. This infuriates me. The Women Life Freedom Movement isn't just about hair. It's about mothers losing custody of the very child they bear. It's about modern women being forced to live under a man's title hidden. It's about laws diminishing the very value of women. Men, women, teens, and children all being killed when rules are broken. We will keep fighting, yelling, screaming, shouting, this is for equality, this is for our liberty. And we will keep chanting and chanting and chanting and chanting until a change is done. Women, life, freedom. Uh, just remember, as the judges are putting up their scores, you can yell higher if you think the scores need to be higher, and it's usually best to do that before the scores go up in the air. So, judges, three, two, one, scores up in the air. We have from left to right a 9.3, a 9.6, a 9.1, and an 8.9. Give it up for the poet and not the poet. This speaking is that far on deck. We have Ashley Keynes, but right now we're going to hear a second poem from Kia Aragon. questions, don't they? Why is the sky blue? Will a watermelon go inside my stomach if I get a watermelon seed? If I make a funny face, will it freeze like this? Yet one question that always stood out to me, are monsters real? Now, although this question may seem quite self-explanatory, I ask you, think again. I'll give you a hint. Some are. But not the ones you're thinking of. These monsters are never truly seen, yet the scars from their bites are clear as day. They can creep up to you and you wouldn't even notice until they have you begging for your freedom. Their feet leave no footprint, yet still hurt when they kick, and their hands have no fingers, yet will strangle you without hesitation. They can disguise themselves as anything. Some may look like funky smelling juice that give you confidence. Some may hide in your brain and steal your motivation and fill it with thoughts that would scare a child, and some even may look like the ones who you think are supposed to protect you. But there's one monster I'm most scared of. This monster has existed for a billion years and will exist for a billion more. It can flash by in a second, or it can stare into your soul for what feels like an eternity. This one doesn't hide in my closet or wait underneath my bed to grab my feet when they leave the comfort of my blanket. It doesn't hide in the dark with glowing eyes, piercing the blackness. It doesn't tap at my window when the night falls. This monster goes with me everywhere, hovering over my shoulder, whispering in my ears, controlling the neurons that fire in my brain like a traffic guard, controlling each car, telling me where to go and what path to take. It controls my life. It controls me. It tells me when to wake up and when to shut my eyes. It tells me why I can't just scroll for one more minute. It wrinkles my skin, weakens my bones and muscles. It smothered my childhood. It takes away my family members. And it shoves scholarships and university applications down my throat before I can even taste them. And the worst part is that it never stops. It never stops for anyone or anything. This monster doesn't just control me. It controls all of us. Its power is greater than you could ever imagine. It pushes down the sun and it pulls up the moon. It makes the leaves turn brown and all the clocks strike at noon. Its power is endless. And no matter how fast I try to run away, its strides are longer, its legs are faster, its power is greater. I cannot compete. I cannot control it. Control. That's a funny word, don't you think? I wish I had control. I wish I could grab this monster by its neck and tell me to leave me alone. Let me stay where life is good. Let me make more memories with the ones I love. Let my grandma stay for a few more years. Just leave me alone. 
I wish I had control of this monster. If you could have any superpower in the world, what superpower would you have? I would choose to control time. Thank you. When I was younger, I loved to swim. I lived and breathed for it like a hymn to the sea, in captivity yet never more free as I clung to my floaties like lifelines, never letting go, and I relied wait, on my goggles like they were my home, as if being able to see would make me a better swimmer instantly. There were a blanket wrapped around me, a false security, a reliance on something I didn't know I didn't need, until suddenly that security shattered. Broken glass, scattered under a, weight, under a difference of opinion and the weight of learning my goggles broke. No longer useful, no longer brave, a night without her armor, no longer safe. I was mad, upset, distressed, you know how kids get, seeing through blurred vision in more ways than one, until I began to understand why it had to be done. I learned how to see with more than just my eyes. I learned how to see beyond the faces and mendacious pages of a book you made, so flawless, but the devil's in the details. And what really matters goes deeper than the surface. Throw away the goggles. They aren't necessary. They're a shield protecting you from reality when reality is exactly what we need. Sometimes it's going to sting. I can't lie. Opening your eyes, recognizing what's actually in front of you, sometimes it hurts when the truth filters in like sunscreen into your skin, but it holds its worth. Throw away the goggles. Learn how to see through the anger, through the fear, because things aren't always going to be that clear. You might as well get used to it. One of these days, those goggles are going to break, and the reality in which you've been living will break along with them. You're going to have to learn how to deal with that. Right now is all that really matters, and the decisions you make today decide tomorrow's patterns. When bad things happen, you can't always just react. Sometimes it's important to wait. Some things don't need to be fixed immediately. Some things take time, and some things aren't meant to be fixed at all. Get rid of the goggles and the rose-colored glasses, the lenses that haven't been showing you the whole truth. There are three sides to every story. Yes, three. Your side, my side, and the truth, because all I've seen is me, and all you've seen is you, and that needs to change. Thank you.
With a flavor so splendid, it beats a home-cooked meal. On days without it, I feel like I'm dying. I curl up into a ball because I can't stop crying. And if I said I didn't love Dr. Pepper, I would surely be lying. Oh, you're saying I have a problem? Well, now I know that you're a dipshit. I've gone my entire life drinking Dr. Pepper, and I'm still not addicted. I don't have a problem, you do. You're just mad we're connected like Bluetooth. Yes, Mom, this link between me and this drink is real. Don't undermine my choices. This isn't a phase, it's just how I feel. This is my belief. I'm not saying this for fun. At the end of the day, when all is said and done, Dr. Pepper will be number one. Three, two, one, up with your scores. We have an 8.1, we have an 8.9, we have an 8.9, 8.4, the Dr. Pepper fans are mad, judges. All right. On deck, we have a poem from Keanu Jukes, but right now we're going to hear a poem from Jada Cameron. He's heard me turn the bass up way too high and hear my dad tell me that my neighbors could probably hear me down the road. Music tells me everything you need to know about someone, which is why I'll continue to play music for someone I've never met. I'll play some Guns N' Roses, I'll play some Raffi, I'll play old classical music that my mom used to get me to sleep. I'll play Christmas music in July to show him that I used to sing Christmas music 24-7 like there was no tomorrow, and to remind him of the Christmas in July parties he and my grandma threw before he died. Music tells you everything you need to know about someone, which is why I love the outdated, old gray, and dusty CD player. I love the volume dial that doesn't turn the volume up half the time. I love the way the smallest speakers can't be heard unless your ear is pressed against it. I love the almost transparent, semi-silver chords that run up my walls. I love it. I love it because every time I play a song, whether it be Shell Crane to help me study, or whether it be the Armageddon soundtrack for variety, whether it be the Chili Peppers while I clean my room, I love it because it connects me with my grandpa Sue. I love it when the volume doesn't change when you turn it up between 9 and 10. I love the sound of the disc being read. I love the way the, the bass bounces my bedroom floor, floor. I love the awkward pauses when the disc is too scratched to be read. Grandpa's CD player will stay in my family forever because he's heard the Guns N' Roses album that was made before they got popular and the Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man soundtrack. He's heard the Indigo Girls and Tim McGraw. Music showed my grandpa Sue that I love me some rock, love me some pop, love me some country music, Love me some Christmas car carols, and love me some of the best movie soundtracks of all time. Here's to hoping that I find a How to Train Your Dragon soundtrack CD, just, as so how mu just how much I respect and appreciate a bone chilling performance. I love the way the music tells you everything you need to know about someone. Because if not, well, let's just be glad there is no if not. Apologetic, or maybe if they just really liked her aesthetic. 
They'd hear her pain as stained glass. Still cracked, a project, but one they're willing to respect. Alas, she's average. So when your symphony of fumes triggers her tears, you'll mock and hate. You are unfit and childish, but not enough to be childless. See, they want the life of her corporate baby. Aw, don't you just hope he comes out in a suit, stock tarts in hand, saying something like, feed the one percent, or respect the demand. When stolen resources come to you with ease, when you know she can't breathe because the attic's been ridden with disease, when you feel her become weak in the knees, remember, she is 16 and pregnant with a part-time job at Earl's and a boyfriend who'd make your mom want to hurl. Clearly, she's not ready, but she's your property. You store your values in her credenza. You call her the consumer, but you've consumed her. She's obsessed with your obsessions. She's possessed by your possessions, and you can't blame her. All you've done is degrade her, berate her into caring about the things that you've related to her. And that weight is far too heavy. That she'll always never be more than envy, and for this baby she must be steady. But she's just not doing enough. Get a thicker skin. But you know it's thin, it's the same drywall you shove your fist in. You've carved your thoughts into every wall. You. You plastered magazines on every window. The only thing still standing is the glass ceiling. But don't worry about the damage deposit. You didn't have to pay it. We're the damaged. It's our fault we've lost it. The fact of the matter is that you have no respect. There is no one you're willing to protect except yourself and your next paycheck. Tossing and turning beneath the sheets. How could I have forgotten this part of myself? 
How easy is it to forget the pain I endured in the past? This little girl in the mirror endured, and she did it alone. Who am I to forget how strong I was? My hands tremble as I reach toward the mirror, scraping my skin on the jarred edges and jagged cuts. I reach out, and as my younger self flinches, I caress her cheek. Please, please forgive me, I say. As a tear trickles down her porcelain skin, she won't look me in the eyes, I withdraw my hand. Perhaps you'll never forgive me, I say, but I promise I'll never forget. don't cry over spilt milk. Well, what if we flip this idiom around for a moment? What if we consider the milk's feelings for once? Now this may seem like a stupidly simple strategy to analyze the many oddities of milk, but if you really think about it, if you stare at a glass of white gold long enough, some questions begin to attack your mind. Among them, why do we drink milk? And should we drink milk? First, we need to think about where milk comes from. Sure, we can contemplate the ethics of furious factory farms peddling out profits at the cost of crying cows, like vultures exploiting some sort of grotesque carcass, but we need to think about where milk truly comes from. I mean, we drink the milk of another animal for crying out loud. Think about a person thousands of years ago, the first person to trap a cow, licking their lips while looking at the utter deliciousness that is that cow's milk. Isn't that just a little weird to you? Now think about the many conflicts of, of milk as well, producing perennial paradoxes of discontent. There are hundreds of milk substitutes and thousands of brands brainwashing us and fighting for control over the market like wolves over bones. There's hemp, oat, rice, cashew, almond, soy, coconut, camel, donkey, goat, buffalo, and cow's milk. How is one to choose amongst the countless options? And are each as sustainable as they really say they are? We can't say for certain where our money is best spent for ourselves or for the environment. Or for cows, I guess, if you really want to think about it. In the end, we may not be able to say if milk is ethical, or if we should drink it, or if there's even a better alternative to traditional cow's milk. But one thing is for certain. That's all a matter of opinion, a back and forth battle that'll never end. And another thing that's for certain is that as long as we continue to work towards some sort of solution in the milk market, we're bound to hit some great milk innovation to save the day. I mean, look at all the progress we've already made so far. And maybe in doing so, society will finally one day realize that cereal is really best had with orange juice. Thank you. to endure any storm, to bounce back with vigor and never conf conform. Sorry. Through all my years of playing hockey, I've tried my best not to be snotty. So instead, I've become, I've become charismatic, 
Never dramatic. I may become competitive, but I just have to remember it's not repetitive. Sometimes I need to remind myself it's not always about that top shelf. I could tell my manager that hockey builds my character. This character changes and stays fluid, but all I have learned and grown will be included down to the bone. I have taken my character and met great friends, the ones who will accept me to the very end. A symphony of hearts beating together, a passion for our sport that will never be scrubbed, and have been there as I have grown up. Teammates are always there to relieve the pressure, but that's the sad part. It doesn't last forever. I have taken my time to connect with these people, to form a bond that resembles the Beatles. Teamwork is a, le a lesson everyone should learn, a bond that will never be burned. I have learned to be a leader, never a cheater, to, take an ex to set an example for all to follow. And I show up to avoid the question, where's Waldo? As a leader, I have built a relationship with all the players on my battleship as we set sail towards a victory and I comfort them in our difficulties. To be a leader, you have to be kind but tough to anyone and everyone a part of us. My kindness carries over to another well-used skill. Sportsmanship tends to be overlooked. I use this skill to keep things tranquil, for if I don't, I will be on the hook. It's about trying my best to keep the peace between two teams and never being self-obsessed to snap out of my head when I hear those screams. The sport of hockey gives me a test of whether one win is worth more than telling someone, you tried your best. I have learned so much from hockey and I will always remember that it has created the person that is me. We have an 8.4 and another 8.6. Give it up for the poet and not the points. This is Emma Tini on deck, but right now we're going to hear a poem from Audrey Giles. Why is the earth round? Why are we here? Are you real? Am I real? Is this a simulation? What if. Hi. My name is Audrey, and I'm a wanderer. Back in the third grade, when I was about a foot and a half shorter, I was tested for giftedness. I remember sitting down at a round table with some other students and answering the most random questions. What is two plus two? What color is an elephant? And a couple months later, the results were in. I failed. So I was normal. Normal? Normal. Despite the fact that I failed the test, that did not stop my brain from questioning our existence. How did the universe form? Is God a real guy, or is he the same concept as Santa? Be a good person, or you're on the naughty list, or in this case, hell, right? Sometimes I would ask my parents these questions. Shockingly, I always got the same response. I don't know, Audrey. Nobody knows. I don't know. Who says that? I mean, come on. And that's how it went. My whole life, no one had the answer. About three months ago, I started turning to myself to find these answers. In retrospect, that was a silly idea, but at the time, it was the best I could come up with. The biggest difference between my nine-year-old self and my 18-year-old self is that since 2014, I have been diagnosed with an anxiety disorder and OCD. My anxiety is your normal kind of anxiety. People are scary. Always order for me. I think I'm gonna throw up, just give me a minute, I'll be in the bathroom if you need me. But my OCD is one of a kind. My OCD clings on to my anxious thoughts. It spins my thoughts around and around like a record player that keeps playing the same track repeatedly. So it comes as no surprise that my OCD decided to cling on to my out of this world thoughts. However, my OCD was not the only one to cling on. Oh, no, no, no. My anxiety did too. My brain really said, it's boring to think about the universe in a positive way. Oh, I have an idea. Let's make it negative. And that's when my anxiety slapped me right back into reality. 
My thoughts went from, hmm, I wonder what's out there, to, oh God, what's out there? Why am I, why are we here? This has to be a simulation, right? And down the rabbit hole I went. The thoughts kept spinning and spinning faster and faster. It felt like I was on a merry-go-round and I couldn't get off. My therapy sessions were helping, but the thoughts weren't gone, just in the shadows. That was until one session with my therapist. There we were, talking about my now-labeled wonder thoughts, when she asked me, what does it matter? It doesn't, I blurted out, hold on. It doesn't matter? For the first time in what felt like an eternity, I could think. It didn't matter, who cares? It was more important to focus on the here, the now. So what does it matter? Why does it matter that we know our purpose, know how the universe was created, know if we are real, oh wait, it doesn't matter. It never did. Thank you. Let's hear it for Let's keep it going. All right, guys. We got to the finish here. So three, two, one, up with those scores. We got a 9.6 for that poll. We got a 9.08, 9.4, and another 9.0. Let's give it up for the poll and the point. This means that Amelia and Priya, you are on deck. But right now, we're going to hear a poem from the team. Sayami. <laughs> Mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake. When will you learn? I've gone with the feeling of fear lurking in my mind. Time by time by time, the desired perfection haunts me. When will you learn? Shh, shh, the mistake is erased, faced with the utter scarcity of feeling the same way. Again, the taste on the tip of my tongue as I tell someone it won't happen again. Little by little, the phrase shrank when I realized I had no friends. Faced with the reality, the past cannot be changed in the end. Once you're up with your bread, the unfollowers become followers and you become a trend. When will you learn? Carrying the weight of a thousand good deeds just for it to be trampled by one tiny mistake. Itching for a better reputation, perspectives flaunt around my head. Shaping my identity and slowly losing motivation. When will you learn? Never. I will simply never be perfect. Perfection is something we chase, but yet so far away. Mistakes are like untouched books on shelves, waiting to be read. Gaining knowledge, that knowledge is what later on will prevent you from laying up all dead. Turning on that Spotify playlist as you make a mistake. Listening throughout the whole day. Oh. <laughs> Remembering as a child, making a mistake. My hatred for my family as I say words that cut deeply, if I say it to their face. Alone in the washroom, looking myself in the mirror, ready to leave, packing my bags, but one problem, I wasn't even a teen. I know it's cliche, but turn that frown upside down. <laughs> But see, in reality, we all make mistakes. What separates us from others is bouncing back up and leaving it up to fate. When will you learn? I've learned, but I won't learn how to be perfect. Thank you. Now, yeah, judges, we got to keep it moving along. So. Furiously running those down and then furiously throwing them in the air. Three, two, one, up with your scores. We have a 9.7. We have a 9.4. We got a 9 and a 9.4. Give it up for the boys. That means that Anton, you are on deck. But right now, we're going to be treated to a group piece from Amelia Sanat and Priya Alexander. Have you ever wished upon a shooting star and forgotten who you are? 
getting lost in the worlds afar. When wishes act like a smokescreen, they protect you from the obscene. No dream is too extreme. The power of wishes doesn't come from the dancing stars above. It comes from the power to inspire, to reach higher, and have my, dra my dreams dance upon the stars while carelessly working overtime to, to please, please my desires. I wish upon a shooting star, but not because it ever worked. I wish upon a shooting star because of all the dreams it sparked. But, but when, when you wish upon a shooting star, it makes no difference who you are. No request is too extreme when all you do is dream. A hopeful breath escapes my lips. I wish, I wish, I wish. The dandelion I hold so close to my face diffuses into a cloud of seeds, yet I still refuse to see. See that my breath does not decide the path that these seeds take. I refuse to see that my yearning and desire does not spread like fire. Chasing, chasing these seeds to where they need to be. I see them escape, they trape across the lands, but yet they have no plans. Blow out your candles, they say. Make a wish, they say. Don't, Don't tell anyone what you wish for, though, otherwise it won't come true. Why do wishes stay hidden? They are not shameful nor wrong, yet somehow wishing makes you less strong? The dreamers get nowhere, get off your feet. And then you might succeed. How am I to succeed without any hope I can get there? How am I to succeed without being aware? Aware of the fact that my wishes are like a lost sailor at sea, drifting along the motion of the ocean. Aware of the fact that my wishes are like the leaves of a tree, the wind pushing them along, yet they have no place to be. Nothing to see. As a child, I wished to see a unicorn, but now I am torn between the purpose and the path that reality has provided. Reality has decided. My life is no longer a wishing well for all my hopes and dreams. Life is no longer about wishing for unicorns and rainbows, that treasured pot of gold. Wishes are now about the truth untold. I wish, I wish, I wish. I watch my life unfold. I, I wish I may, I wish I might, but might not wish right. For a wish is merely insight into the shooting stars that shine so bright. I wish, I wish, I wish. When I close my eyes and cross my fingers, I wish to see the man on the moon peek his head out and smile at me to solidify the stories that were told when I was younger. Because now I ponder, was I ever right? But as I think this over, I watch my eyelash float on down to the ground and I think of the man on the moon. I wish upon the first star I see tonight. Up above the world so high like a diamond in the sky. Twinkle, twinkle, twinkle little star, oh how my wishes have gotten me far. Awesome, keep it going for Amelia and Priya. So much harder than it looks. All right, judges, do not be split by me. Three, two, one, up with your scores. We have a 9.3, a 9.5, a 9.4, and a 9.0. Give it up for the poets and not the poets. This means that on deck we have Nicole, but right now we're going to hear a poem from Anton Yellowsaw. In a world of minds entwined, where knowledge takes its flight, where eager hearts seek wisdom's depths in a realm so bright. But amidst this realm of learning, where intellect seeds are sown, a hollow force emerges, a shadow all its own. Children, innocent seekers with dreams within their grasp, now tempted by the cunning whispers, a digital knowledge class. They wield AI's power like a double-edged sword, one that's 50 times stronger but also easier to hold. AI is like a drug. It will help you through a tough time, but when you start, you can't stop. And you'll keep going and going until your use of it is over the top. And before you know, you'll become so slow. And before you recognize it, you won't even be able to realize it when the answer is staring you right in the face. Because you get so used to being told and showed what you should say, you never stop to ponder whether what you're being told is warm or cold. Everything that it's ever done has been completely heartless. Regardless of your prompt, this machine will never adopt the thing that makes us human. Like you and I, the ability to lie, to ask why, or to even say I. I try, I cry, I die. Why is it that AI can never say I? The only time I've heard AI say I is when AI said, I cannot give you the details on this subject as it contradicts with my programming and primary directive. AI is like a crutch. It will help you through a tough time, but use it too much and you'll start to grow a hunch. 
you're only going to hurt yourself. Because why even go to school if you're just going to be a fool whose ideas were all made by a fool? Someone who does not realize how much they could have grown if they hadn't been such a stone. Oh, if only they could have known. But now, I guess, their potential will remain forever unknown. You know, I asked ChatGPT to write an artist bio for me, and I discovered that apparently I've made several films, which was news to me. All right, judges, three, two, one, up with your scores. We have a 9.6, a 9.1, a 9.2, and a 9.4. Give it up for the poet who got the point. This is our last three poets here. So on deck, we have Serenity Pope, but right now we're going to hear a poem from Nicole Hughes. <laughs> and bugs in quantities of metric tons. See, the bugs I have relate to the binary. The way I think isn't advisatory. It's not my priority to worry about society. See, it's because of emotion. Both others and mine don't make sense entirely. I've been asked how I knew they were sad. I don't think they expected to go through the lines of code of my brain to understand. Every emotion I've ever witnessed compartmentalized into little boxes ready to be pulled up at a moment's notice. I read your face like an AI attempts to unlock your phone through information I've been programmed to see. Resting faces cause me to buffer, even if you couldn't be calmer. To me, you look like you're sad and mad. Don't blame me, I just misstand. Your eyebrows are drawn and your lips turned down. You're thinking about what I'll never understand. For your face screams like a cry for help, begging to be saved, begging to be seen, begging to be secured. See, so don't blame me for my error when your emotion can't be found on the Y database that is my brain. My biggest pet peeve is when you think you're joking, pretending to be serious to get me laughing. See, I haven't been programmed to understand. For the love of, for the love of every line of code ever written, don't reply to my confusion after my brain is trying to get past the spinning wheel of confusion with, what, you thought I was joking? Yes, I thought you were joking. I wasn't programmed to understand your stupid joke. My blueprints never included a section of how to deal with our emotions. How am I to understand? Every emotion I have ever seen, I've taught myself to understand, to react, to not be seen like a freak, stupid, or brash. I think I'm closer to an AI than a human. I'm given data upon data upon data. I can read and then sort so I can puzzle through what you're feeling by filing through the Expel spreadsheet that is my mind to find your specific facial changes. Uh, I think something was wrong when I was assembled. If you were a machine, you'd be factory built, put together through perfect calculation, all the same, all connected, and in sync. See, when I was built, I was built by an amateur with broken parts, damaged GPU, and having to restart but I was made out of love. I may be unable to see through all the pop-ups and tabs of emotions, feeling, and taboo. I know how I feel, and I know it's real. If a caption ever came up for emotions instead of buses, I know I'd fail it if I ever touched it. But this means I've just worked harder. I'm proud of myself for getting this much farther to love and being recognized loved in return. So maybe my instructions were wrong and I came out wonky. But that doesn't mean I'm broken or shoddy. For my brain's a computer that doesn't read in binary. Uh, let's hear it one more time for Nicole Hughes. Hey uh, <laughs> judges, your pre penultimate score. Three to one, up in the air. We got a 9.5, a 9.6, a 9.8, and a 9.6. Give it up for the poet and the boy. This means that on deck and rounding things out will be Paige Duma, but right now we're going to hear a poem from Serenity Poe! <laughs> out there. 
When I'm on top of it all, when I feel like I could never fall, it downpours more than I've ever seen before. Therefore, under my jacket, I must cower. My mood threatens to sour, but all I want to do is sing in the rain like a main character dancing under a lamppost in the middle of the lane. Why can't the weather match my mood? It's a beautiful day. The sun, as bright as white and teeth, the sun grinning down at me, but the heat may as well be from a a volcano on the verge of eruption, spontaneous combustion, my heart pounding in my ears, drowning out all rational thoughts and fears. I wish the world could be tucked in with a blanket of ash made from the bodies of my enemies. Why can't the weather match my mood? Late at night, not a star in sight, wish it was overcast, but I'm on an empty stage, a blank page on a test someone forgot to fill in. Can't escape the limelight, courtesy of the man on the moon who I can't fight. Neon signs glare at me from storefront doors like strangers waiting to rip apart my very core. Soldiers standing at attention. I'm filled with so much apprehension. Would everyone please look away? I feel like I'm on display. Why can't the weather match my mood? Warning for a heavy snowfall. Black ice biting at the tires of cars, wanting to catch itself another victim. Wind wicked, threatening to pick up my house, send it to another world, and end a witch. But I never felt more warm. Beaming ferociously, get to see my family and decorate the Christmas tree. Continue with traditions, but with some new additions. Why can't the weather match my mood? The pink, orange, and yellow hues blind me from where I sit on the beach. I could raise the water levels of the ocean with all this being in the open. I wish my tears would mix with the rain. Mascara stains my skin, my face, like a badly done painting, all the colors bleeding and running into each other, an abstraction of my pain. I wish I had another life. Everyone causes me so much strife. Who needs to change? They need to change. I need to change. Don't be silly, the weather needs to change. Why can't the weather match my mood. Partly cloudy, scattered showers, clear skies, sunny days. I think I'm under the weather, sick. Pick an emotion from the swirling ticket chamber. A little kid again and so much pressure. Feels like a coffin, claustrophobia setting in. I begin feeling one way, but like the seasons, my mood must change. Why can't I feel what I feel no matter the sunshine or the rain? It doesn't have to reflect my high spirits or immense emotional strain. My mood and the weather are one and the same, a temporary state set to change because nothing is everlasting. Why does the weather match my mood? And for the second and last time today, the judges are going to ask you three, two, one, up with your scores. We have a 9.6, we have a 9.3, a 9.4, and another 9.4. Give it up for the poet and not the points. All right, no one is on deck. What is on deck is the People's Choice Award and uh, our final score. And then we're going to give out the, uh, uh, we're going to recognize the top uh, two in the category of poets in the categories of grade 11s and grade 12s. Uh, but before that, we gotta hear one last poem, so let's give a warm welcome to Paige Durban! Okay. So I have a friend, and I can't tell if she's become my enemy because of my envy, but she's a part of me that's never really gonna leave. Her symphonic silhouette always shows her presence, but only on sunny days, and though she is silent, her image screams at me. Her outline morphs with time beside her expectations, growing taller, leaner, more abstract. As the day passes on, her shot turns David's from a heroic fable to a nursery rhyme, always making sure I'm waiting to be alive, hitting me where it hurts every time, my friend. The epitome of perfection never stands where I stand. Her darkness, soft and static, is always right beside me, right behind me, right before me. And taunting, she's attached at my feet and yet I can never find a way to reach her. She knows I cannot close our distance fast enough because she is the one with a spoonful stride. She knows she is the one that has a pain, 
She knows I cannot put on the same face she wears because she's the one with painless pride. She knows I can't reach her same goals because she's the one who truly tried. My symphonic silhouette was put in combat training just to beat me. Form to be the better version, change with time, and always mold her expectations to fit the perfect stone to throw. My nails are brittle and broken. Uneven from scratching at the hopes of her, a noise far worse than scratching a chalkboard, but I cannot stop. And then, she gives me a choice each morning, a rusty red pill of envy to an ocean blue of acceptance and waits for a response. I always end up choosing rust, mistaking it for copper, choking down oxygen into my lungs, trying to turn it blue. She is a hard pill to swallow. So why is it harder to take it? And why is it easier hoping it'll change? Rust is the disintegration of my self-worth and I take it, hoping. But I call her my friend, my envious friend, my enemy, my shadow. She has always been me, but I can never be her. She's a part of me that's never gonna leave. Bringing us to a close, three, two, one, up with your final scores. We have a 9.7, we have a 9.7, a 9.8, and a 9.5. Give it up for the poet and not the poet. <laughs> now the adjective screen with the QR code, I imagine will be lowered shortly. Uh, and this is where you will be using your pocket robots, go into that QR code uh, site, wherever it takes you, entering a name. The name may be uh, any one of these. Anita, Kia, Ashley, Matthew, Jada, Kia.